Come on, Facebook, get faster. <laughs> there we go. Oh, there you go. You look good. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and Sarah's doing just fine? She is. She got real sick um, last week with the flu. And she was down for a few days. Um, but mm -hmm. she's doing good now. Back to back to normal. But other outside of just that random little blip, she's doing really well. Oh, good. Good, yeah. good, good, good. That's great. That's great. Glad to hear. Yeah. And so, oh, well, everybody's calling. How exciting. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and get rolling. Um, basically, it's kind of like the recap of 2023, what you expect to 2024. Are we seeing in, um, increases in foreclosures, short sales? Um, what's going on with rents? Um, and um, And then the second half is really about the five steps for getting the most out of your house, because that seems to really pull um with our it doesn't matter where they come from whether it be overseas or whatever the you know what that's a biggie um so uh, so if we can do that is that cool yeah that sounds good great let's get rolling record hello welcome to the saving with steve show where we talk about the ins and outs of money pretty much everything under the sun that relates to you having a happier healthier relationship with money I want to thank you for joining us today, sharing us with your friends and family. We start the sixth year off with almost 800,000 viewers and listeners. Uh, so we're very, very excited about that. We've got one heck of an episode because there's so much going on in the world today. Uh, and we've had so many requests from our, our viewers and our listeners line of what's going on with real estate. So I have Glenn Henderson here. He's a real estate expert. He's been on the show many times before over the last couple of years. And he really great provides great content. So this is something you really want to pay attention to, take notes on, because if you're looking to sell or buy something or just understand how to get the most out of your house, you really want to take some notes. So with that, I want to welcome Glenn Henderson to the show. Hey, Steve. Thanks for having me on again. Yeah, I'm, we're actually really glad you're here. So um, <clears throat> right now. Let's just do a little recap of what was going on in 2023, because I heard from people, oh, the prices are too high, their interest rates are too high, but there's still a lot of houses being bought and sold. Uh, so help us understand what was going on in 2023, and then let's talk about 2024. Yeah. So 2023 um, year started out well, and um, we started out through spring into summer, rates were down from where they had been in 2022. Um, by third or end of third quarter, beginning of fourth quarter, we saw rates starting to go back up. Um, and then about October, we got hit the 8% mark. And that basically put the brakes on the market. And when we saw that happen, you know, we went from the sixes to eights in a matter of a couple of weeks. So October, November were very slow months. Um, very few sales were happening. December, we saw rates starting to gradually come down week by week. And with each incremental drop in rates, we saw a little bit of an uptick in buyer activity. And even though December is typically a slow month, it was busier than what we had seen the previous two months just because of the impact that the rates had. So going in, coming into the new year, rates have continued on that downtrend, which is good to see. Um, inventory was the biggest challenge in 2023 um, because of where rates are right now. Um, people, very few people are making transitions um, because if the traditional move up buyer you know, that's now bought a house and they're in a mortgage that's at two, three, four percent and they're evaluating moving up into a new property, you know, and they're looking at a rate of six, seven percent, it just doesn't make sense payment wise, even though they would be walking away with a lot of equity. Same thing on the reverse side, the move down buyers that kids are gone, they're empty nesters, you know, they'd be looking for a smaller home or relocating to a different area for their retirement stage. When they're looking at the rates and what payments would be, that doesn't make sense. So the, a lot of them aren't transitioning unless they're transitioning out of state where they're able to buy all cash. Um, so we're mm -hmm. seeing for us being in California, we're seeing a lot of people still leaving California to the less expensive areas because they're able to um, sell and pay cash. But um, outside of the people leaving, um, it's really life events that are a majority of the sales. So 
Um, people have passed away and inherited properties, divorces, um, you know, job losses, or other reasons that have caused um, you know, just the income to go down and they're financially strained. But um, hopefully as we get into the new year and a lot of the forecasts are that because rates have started to come back down and we do have a lot of buyers that are in that or people that have bought over the last two years are in that five, six percent range that we'll start to see some of those homes coming back on the market and we will start to see some increase in inventory. Mm -hmm. And where are rates right now? So if you're in a conventional, um, so which is roughly under 900,000, you're in the mid to high 6% range. If you're for a single family, if you're buying a condo, then you're in the low 7% range. Um, the jumbo loans, depending on uh, down payment um, and depending on the lender, anywhere from mid to upper sixes into the low 7% range. Mm -hmm. So obviously costs have gone up significantly for people. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about, you know what, we had COVID and that delayed the whole short sale um, foreclosure market because of the that had to work its way through the court system. And we're seeing that work its way through the court system. So are we seeing more short sales, foreclosures and things like that? Are those ticking up or? So we're not seeing the, we're not seeing the um, short sales and foreclosures, at least not yet, um, because through the COVID, um, through that time, prices ran up 30, 40, 50%, depending on what area you're in. So the people still have equity, mm -hmm. but what we are, we're not seeing unless you have access to the data, there's a significant amount of people that are in default um, mm -hmm. from the COVID forbearance programs. So throughout the US, it was approximately 2.3 uh, million people took the forbearance program. So basically they were able to stop making payments. Um, 1.7 million of those people still owe um, the money. And there was two ways that it's paid back. Either it gets added on to the end of the mortgage um, or which majority of lenders did not go that route. The majority took whatever that amount was that was not paid. And then, so say if you had 30,000, then at that 30,000 is split up over 12, 24, 36 months. So now somebody's payment has gone up significantly. Well, part of that forbearance program is one of the guidelines or the stipulations was those are not reported late on a mortgage um, because it was to protect people during the COVID and the downturn. Well, that stipulation didn't clarify and it was just a blanket stipulation. So all of the people that are now in these forbearance programs that aren't making payments, none of that's being reported on credit. So there's actually a large number of people that are in default that's not being reported anywhere. And it's so when you look at mortgage defaults and even though we're seeing that they are on an increase and a gradual increase, those are not actual numbers that's actually much higher because of the people that are um, in the forbearance programs that are not making payments. So for our state, California, for example, there's 900,000 people roughly that are not making payments on those forbearance programs that's not reported anywhere in the um, delinquent. Um, if you look at just delinquent mortgages or any of the um, stats on um, people that are behind. And in the, I, let's see, it was probably in the last four weeks, but there was, you may have seen it in the news, but the Veterans Administration, so VA, put a moratorium on foreclosures because what they realized is all of the um, service members and people that, veterans that have used these VA loans that took this forbearance program, this COVID forbearance program, it was forcing them into foreclosure because they're not able to make up these payment plans or make the payments on these payment plans and the, um, they realized they can't just be basically forcing all these people into losing their homes. So they put a moratorium on foreclosures while they try and work out a solution. And what they're looking at is taking the amount that was owed, adding it to the balance, and then recasting the mortgage. So the recasting means just over the remainder of the life of the loan, then the payment is now based off of, you know, if you had 30000 in deep and forbearance, um, that forbearance amount was 30,000, that gets added onto the total balance of the loan, recast over the remaining life of the loan. So then it's a very gradual increase in payment and something that's manageable for most people. Yeah, I could see that if somebody has 27 years to go on a loan, or I'm sorry, 25 years to go on a loan, 
uh, and they've got to add in thirty thousand dollars. If they're just adding a little bit each year, that's not that significant. Exactly. So I, I can, you know, it might be an extra hundred dollars a month or two, which is very much more manageable than to double a payment. Yes. So exactly. And then the other challenge right now too is for especially well for our state for California is with um, the home insurance providers. And then people are seeing premiums going up 20, 30, 40%. So, I did. <laughs> yep. So did we. So, so, you know, in addition to a lot of these people that were any of these people who are in these forbearance programs that they're getting double hit because then they've got premiums going up, but then just for the, everybody as a whole premiums are going up and even people that are in HOAs um, or condos, they're being affected because the HOA's policies are going up significantly, which then has to be passed down to everybody in the community through the increase in HOA dues. So that's the other area that's putting a lot of pressure on our market right now. Wow. So, um, yeah, it just, it was really interesting. Now, how, do you, has the, like, my understanding is there's a number of insurance carriers that are no longer providing health insurance for, or not, I mean, homeowners insurance for yeah. the state of California. And we still have a, a a few, and some are not accepting more new people. So, which are the carriers that are actually accepting? Um, um, do you know the carriers that are accepting continuing to accept homeowners in the state of California? I'm actually not real sure. You know that I just rely on our insurance broker to help and guide us. But we're going through it right now. Um, just this week, you know, been in the process of. Um, starting to get quotes to evaluate, you know, who's available and what the premiums are going to be. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's really interesting. And now they're the insurance companies are looking at further inspections to make sure they they've got worthwhile houses to insure. Yeah. So it's kind of a double whammy on everything. So, and yeah, I totally understand that ours ours um, ours is up thirty five percent, and we're not even in a, in a you know a fire area or earthquake yeah. area or anything like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then some of these people that are in those even you know, the more high fire severity zones and a lot of people that have owned homes for you know, decades and they're on a retirement fixed income and you know, they've been able to adjust to small increases over time. But when they're getting hit with 30, 40, 50, 60 percent premium adjustments, it's putting them in really tough financial positions, too. So hopefully they figure out something to correct this because it's it can't continue to go like this. Oh, I, I totally agree. I totally agree because that just doesn't work for the homeowners. And that would cause more people to leave the state of California and all that kind of good stuff. So, hey, folks, you want to stick with us? We're going to be right back with some more Glenn Henderson. That was perfect, Glenn. Great. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna... Well, you, you kind of know the routine, so. <laughs> yep. So, but I, is, is, are you, you know, like, uh, I don't know what the volume you're closing the house is, but have these, um, the uh, home insurers been, have created an impact on somebody being able to afford a house because they might be thinking, hey, we got twelve fifteen hundred dollars $1,500 for a homeowner's policy, but now it's twenty one or $2,400, adding a couple hundred dollars to their payment, and that could mess with their financing as well. Is that something you're seeing at all? Absolutely. Yeah. We just had one. Um, gosh, it was two days, the Friday before Christmas. Um, I got the call and it was a cancellation on one of our deals because the insurance premium was going to be so high that it um, did exactly what you said as far as the um, qualification and what it did to the payment. It wasn't going to work anymore. So the, yeah, that is an issue we're running into. Yeah, I could see that because um, in the last since COVID, my homeowner's insurance has actually doubled. Yeah. Um, it, it, well, it's almost doubled. It was like 1200. Now it's like $2,100 a year. So I can see that that's pretty brutal. So, yeah. Okay. And that's where, you know, for these people that are on fixed incomes and it's, you know, it's scary. It's putting them in really tough positions. Well, you know, we do the tax reduction thing and there's a number of people that are actually like, you know, former, you know, they're military and all that, but they're retired. And the reality is they got an inflation adjusted income, but it doesn't get inflation just by 2%, not seven or eight. Yeah. Uh, uh, so the reality is their income, cost of living and everything is going up when their income is just 
just stepping up right here. So they've actually chosen to take the equity and leave and go to another state. Uh, yeah. So, but all right, let me get the second segment going. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll, I'll get in trouble and we'll be late. Um, <clears throat> okay, here we go. Hey, Cameron, this is segment two with Glenn Henderson. So here we go. Five, four, three, two, one. Hey, welcome back to the Saving with Steve show where we talk about the ins and outs of money, pretty much everything on the sun that relates to you having a happier, healthier relationship with money. I want to encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, our, um, our affiliates at UK Health Radio, BBS Radio, Talk Radio New York City. All these networks are dedicated to empowering you to solve problems and lift your spirit and live a life of personal financial freedom. You can always go check us out at uh, Saving with Steve Sexton on Facebook. Get behind the scenes stuff, guest gifts, the whole shot. Let's really get back to what we're talking about, which is real estate with Glenn Henderson. Glenn, welcome back to the show. Hey, thank you, Steve. Now, we talked about what's going on in real estate. And, you know, we we were on the break, we were just talking about Hey, um, what's going on with um, the homeowner's insurance and how it's affecting some people's ability to get their mortgage closed because of the, uh, the rates and stuff like that. Now, one of the big things that we want to talk about is every environment's a little bit different, but there's a few things people could do. And I know you almost have this patented, like five things that you know people can do to sell their house for the most amount of money. And I was wondering if you could just walk us through those five things over the next 10 minutes so our listeners can hear that they can take notes and all that kind of good stuff. Because I've talked to many people that you've helped and those steps have made a gigantic difference from them not losing money on the back end, getting more out of it, um, not being too crazy about trying to get the highest price, but then getting a higher price than they actually thought because they did it the right way. So Glenn, if you could share that with us, I, I'd love it. Yeah, absolutely. So number one, is the pre-inspection. This is what a lot of people don't do. And I feel it makes such a significant impact or difference in the sale because once you get into escrow and you're selling your home, there's two reasons that homes typically fall out of escrow. And the number one predominant one is inspections and problems that come up. So by doing a pre-inspection before putting the home on the market, it's the same inspection that a buyer would come in or, or the same inspection a buyer would hire somebody to do and come in and do once you get into escrow. So by doing it up front, we're able to determine if there's any issues, any problems that we're not aware of. And then we can determine, is this something we should fix or not fix? But even if we don't fix it, at least then we can disclose it up front. And then in our counter offer or offer, we're able to put in that the sale is as is, the buyer's aware of these issues. So it doesn't become a problem when we're two, three weeks into the transaction. And that's been a crucial step in being able to help ensure that we're not dealing with a second point of negotiation once we're in contract, because a lot of buyers like to use that as, well, I did my inspection, this, you know, this, this, and this came up. So I want a $10,000 credit to go towards my closing costs. And it's almost become a trend where people don't even, it's not about the problems. It's just about how much money can I get off the sale by use, leveraging my inspection. So having that inspection upfront takes a point takes away that leverage point that the buyers would have that's great because i've heard many stories about people losing 20 30 40 50 thousand dollars over something they that didn't even cost that much to get fixed yeah. so yeah that's good to know so what's next then second is the staging so staging you know, a lot of times people hear staging and they just think okay that's bringing furniture in, into a house if it's empty but by stage with staging what we mean is focusing on first curb appeal. So whether it's, you know, painting, pressure washing, you know, planting some flowering um, plants in the front, add some color, cleaning up the lawn, whatever we need to do to enhance the curb appeal. Because when somebody pulls up to the house, what they see sets that and sets the expectation. And, you know, that's that first inter impression of the home. And then once we get inside, if somebody's still living in the home, that's decluttering, sometimes taking some furniture out. Um, oftentimes we'll remove furniture and then have our stager bring um, items in for just one room or one area. If it is a vacant home, then staging all of the main living areas, kitchen, bathrooms, and then the primary bedroom and bathroom. Um, usually we don't focus on the auxiliary bedrooms just because the master or primary bedroom is the one that, you know, the decision maker and who's make, paying the money is most concerned with. Um, mm -hmm. But so staging is basically 
improving the overall look of the home. But um, on a vacant home, I 110% feel that not only feel this way, but we've tested and a staged home will always get more um, views online because it looks better. It will get more showings. And then in the end, we're going to sell for a higher price. You know, what about something I thought, um, what about people who have all the family pictures up there? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, is that something that, you know, it, 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 that needs to be staged as well? Yeah. So part of the decluttering or, you know, paring down um, process would be taking down all of those photos, um, family photos, personal photos, things like that you want to put away. Um, it's one, you want to have more open wall space because it helps um, the room feel larger, but also for the personal photos, it distracts buyers because it inevitably anybody time somebody's going through a home, they're going to look at the pictures. They want to see, do I know that person or, and they just then get caught up in looking at the photos. Um, hallways, you all, always want to remove all the photos. A lot of times people use hallways for either um, family photos or just artwork. But um, photos and art along the hallways can make them feel smaller and make it feel a little more claustrophobic, if you want to say. Um, but yeah, family photos you always want to take down and put away. Okay, cool, cool. Because I, I always got the feeling that if there's too many photos, you know, how can I feel like this could be my house? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's why you just want somebody to be able to walk in and see themselves in it, not be focused on the family that lives there. It's good to know. Okay, and what's next? Third is the um, pricing. So with pricing the home, um, you've got to, it's so crucial to make sure we get the pricing correct up front. And a lot of times the mistake people make is going with too high of a price. So sometimes it's the sellers and the sellers feel that, you know, well, it's better to start higher. So I have some room to negotiate down. Sometimes it's the realtors that give them the wrong advice. Um, oftentimes we see realtors tell people what they want to hear just in order to get the deal, knowing that they're going to have to reduce it later. But basically in the pricing, if you price a home too high, what's going to happen is it's going to sit on the market. And that's you know one of the two reasons home doesn't sell. It's either overpriced or there's some type of a problem with either the house or the way, it, usually it's the marketing and the way it shows, which ties in the staging. So if it's priced too high and you're sitting on the market, inevitably you're going to have to do price reductions. And then whether there's price reductions or there's just more time on the market, when buyers see that, then the interpretation is, or the feeling is, okay, well, they've been on the market for a while. They're going to be more flexible or there's, I'm going to have a better opportunity to negotiate a better price. And they're going to come in lower. And then they're in, basically in more of a position of control in the negotiations, where if you price it accurately at market value or even slightly below market value, then as it hits the market, people can see it and say, okay, this is a good deal. I'm interested. And the goal is to price it accurately, market it well, so that you have multiple buyers that are interested in the property and you create that situation or position where you have multiple offers. And when we're in that position, then we're able to negotiate terms that are favorable for the seller instead of the buyer having more control in the negotiations or having the upper hand in the negotiations. Yeah, no, I, 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 I've seen that. Actually, I've heard that from some of the people that you've represented. They said it was great because the person we selected wanted a 10 day escrow and they were going to pay cash. So I didn't have to worry about anything. <laughs> yeah. So so I think that's really cool. And what's the last one? Yeah. Oh, so uh, marketing. Um, so with the marketing, um, what we what I like to say is there's uh, most agents are passive. So they'll get the photos, they put it online, they put a sign out front, and then they just wait for something to happen and wait for buyers to come through. Where you need an agent that's really going to be actively and aggressively marketing the property. So through notifications throughout the neighborhood, and um, we do a pre-listing um, campaign. So we like to go on the market on a Tuesday. We're pushing marketing like sit through mail, social media, the internet, but driving as much interest to the property before it actually goes live on Friday. And then we start the showings and open houses over the weekend because we want to create a buzz and interest and excitement about the property. And during that first week and during the open house or just during the showings, 
we want as many people coming through because that human psychology of if other people want it, then it must be worth it and it must be a good opportunity. So it helps motivate people to take action quicker or more quickly. Well, that's, that's, uh, I didn't even thought of it that way, but I, I, you know, if you have a volume of people looking at a volume of people saying, Hey, this looks nice, this looks nice. And you know what? Uh, I can see how it creates that buzz. Yeah. So, and people have that kind of that fear of missing out. So if they like the home and it's been on the market for three weeks, then they'll take time to make a decision because they feel like, okay, I've got a little bit of time, but if it's just hit the market, they see five other people looking at the property then that's like, okay, I like this home and I might lose out to one of these other people. I need to act quickly so I don't lose out on this opportunity. That's great. That's good to know. So, okay, Glenn, here's the biggie, the biggie I need to ask you because I know there's always somebody who wants your help. So how do people get in contact with you? Uh, what websites should they go to? Yeah, so phone number is 619-500-3222. And then best website is my, so my, M -Y, and then premierhomes.com. So that's phone number, guys, 619-503-222 in my premier home. So you just want to go there. You get a hold of Glenn. He's got all this wonderful information for you. And if you're looking to sell your house, he's the guy to go to. Glenn, thank you so much for being on the show today. We very much appreciate you. I know our, our audience does because every time you come on, somebody's very happy because they appreciate that even though they might not be in the same state you're in they've, they've learned something and you know what they probably get more out of their house so thanks again for being with us today and and hopefully you'll be back next time hey thanks again steve have a great day all right we'll see you bye bye okay perfect that was wonderful glenn great. wonderful wonderful thank um, you what's um, um i'm going your, to be uh, what's the youtube channel it's um, Steve's uh, YouTube at Steve, uh, Steve at Sexton Advisory Group, or I'm sorry, um, Saving with Steve Sexton. Okay. Perfect. So there's a hundred in um, iTunes, Spotify, all the episodes are up there as well. Okay. And uh, this one, this one get edited and it'll be out in about a week or two. Perfect. I think 11 days from today. Um, Got it. Okay. okay. As cool. always, thank you. Hey, uh, no, I was going to say, um, um, do you handle stuff up in the um, Canyon Canyon Lake area uh, uh, up here? Oh, yeah. Up in your area? Definitely. Yeah. I have somebody's mom who just passed away. She's got like seven, eight acres with four dwellings on it and stuff like that. I don't know what the daughter's looking to do. If she's looking to, I don't know, divide it up on, you know, on the homes and everything. The homes were actually designed for our, all of her kids and three of her boys passed away before she did. And she's just got one, uh, the one daughter has everything now. So, um, um, but, um, so I'll, I'll be talking to her tomorrow. So I'll probably be, her name's Christine Holodinsky. Really, really nice. She actually lives in the Vegas area. Um, um, so um, she'll probably get in a hold of you when she gets everything worked around. Um, Cause she's going to look at, she doesn't, she might keep one place for herself. She might look at developing it and then having to sell it type thing. But uh, she told me that she goes, I, I can't handle this whole place by myself. So I've got to figure out what I'm going to do. Okay, so. perfect. Yeah, I would love to help her. And um, I'm up that way quite a bit. I'm, I'm even up in uh, Idlewild right now. So really? Yeah. Idlewilds. Yeah. That's a fun drive all the way up that hill. Yeah. It's the trek out there, but it's nice once you get out there. So. Do you, uh, do you go through the 371 through Burnt, uh, Burnt Canyon? So when I get up, like this go up there, I've been going up and getting off in Temecula and then heading out yes. through Temecula. And that's the 371 going up the back way, right? Yeah, that's 371, goes to Mountain Center, and then you turn left at Mountain Center and go into Idlewild. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So I go out that back way. It's a nice drive. I mean, I don't mind it at all. It takes a little while, but um, yeah, it's... Um, have you run into many, uh, musicians? Not too many yet. There's a lot of musicians up there. Are there? Oh yeah. Um, you know, like if you like the eighties rock and roll bands, yeah. a lot of them, a lot of people are up there. Interesting. I mean, it makes sense because it's such a secluded area where if you wanted a nice little retreat and not a lot of people, I feel like it's one of those mountain towns that not a lot of people know about still. Um, 
you know what um what is it what's this guy i he did he this is a guy he has probably a 1500 square foot home and the whole thing set up like a music studio and he has a room in a kitchen and that's it okay yeah. and but what he does is people will go up there and record with him and uh what is it um uh, what's that? The guitarist from Metallica was there when I showed up, and this guy's been on everything from, um, like, um, he was he did stuff for Stefan Wolf all the way from the seventies all the way up, and he had all these pictures of people and all that stuff, and told stupid stories about people. Uh, but uh, there's a ton of them up there. He started going, yeah, he just lives around the corner. And he lives around the corner. They come over, we jam, we do this. <laughs> Funny. And that actually makes a lot of sense. I mean, because of where it is and you could kind of go up there and get away. Yeah. He said it's one of those places where they can actually go walk around the downtown. Yeah. And there's, you know, people know who they are, but they're not yeah. all over them type thing. Just, um, but now that they're older, people don't recognize them as much. Right. Um, so, I mean, they're my age and older, so uh, yeah. <laughs> so they all start to look like me, bald head and everything. So, all right. Hey, look, I'll let you go. Hey, I appreciate it a lot, Glenn. And we'll get this back out on YouTube in probably 11 days. And um, this will air um, our, our, um, you have a referral thing for across the country, right? So yeah, like if exactly. you know, somebody got, okay, so good. All right. So I just want to make sure because um, I had somebody says, yeah, I was looking for somebody in real estate, but your guy's in California. I go, but he knows somebody you might want to call him. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Anywhere, anywhere they need. Um, I've got people, good people throughout the uh, the country. So just let me know anytime. OK, cool. I'll just make sure they go to you. OK, Perfect. thanks, Glenn. We'll see you, man. Thanks, Appreciate Steve. it. Take care. Here we go. OK. All right. Hey. We're moving into the final segment, which is mine there, uh, Cameron. And again, this is episode 165 with Glenn Henderson. So here we go. Hello, welcome back to the Saving with Steve show where we talk about the ins and outs of money. You know what? Pretty much everything in the Senate relates to you having a happier, healthy relationship with money. And I do want to talk to you a little bit about money. I want you to understand a couple of things that many people aren't talking about when it comes to our economy. And that's the geopolitical tensions. You know what? I was reminded today and, you know, you don't want to forget about the geopolitical tensions and how they can directly affect our economy. One area that's not being spoken about today is the financial media is the, the shipping problems in the Red Sea. Today, Iran seized another oil tanker linked to the U.S. You know, and, and right at this moment, the U.S. has to make a decision of what they're going to do. We've been talking about how the markets have been priced with interest rate cuts and things like that. However, soaring prices and shipping delays are about to surprise the Federal Reserve and the markets because it's another way that's going to create a problem with supply chain and increase the cost of things, which means inflation. Okay. And you know what? And these soaring prices and shipping delays, you know what? They're about to surprise, it, uh, surprise the markets and the Fed. And especially if a solution is not found quickly. Shipping companies right now are diverting their vessels to much longer routes, adding time and expenses. You add that to the Panama Canal, it's facing supply chain headwinds due to drought. And you know what? With this, you have a recipe for financial turmoil. Why is this important to everybody that's listening to me? Because the demographic of the people listening to me, they're in a situation that, you know, when you say, hey, simply put, it will have a direct effect on your financial well-being. We're not in 2003 or 2008. You're now at an age where you've, you, you've never been faced with issues which before did not truly affect your financial well-being because, the, you know, your lifestyle is being fueled by your income from a job. And if you don't have that job, oh, my God, it creates a problem. So it's really very important if you're in that retirement phase or about to retire Make sure you have that purpose money. And that purpose money is that short-term money that's going to create the income for you to support and maintain your lifestyle. You don't want anything creating a problem for that short-term money because time is the enemy of short-term money. On the flip side, you have that performance money. 
Okay. That's that growth stuff. Okay. And you know what? Short terms is the enemy of performance because when you look at the market, as long as you have enough time, it will continue to grow. So the key here is make sure you have purpose money to support and maintain your lifestyle. Make sure you have that performance money because it's going to go up and down, but over time, it's always higher. You don't want to just have one and not have enough of others but because it'll adversely affect your lifestyle. I want to thank you all for joining us today on Saving with Steve. I hope I imparted some knowledge. Glenn gave you some wonderful tips on real estate. And you know what? We'll look forward to seeing you next time. Stay safe, stay healthy. And we'll see you next time right here on Saving with Steve. Bye-bye.